Good morning, and thank you so much for a beautiful summer. As we examine the idea of the best seat in the house, I would like to take some time to provide a little background to this passage before we dive in. At the beginning of today's scripture, Jesus was invited to the home of one of the Pharisees' leaders on the Sabbath for a meal. It was one of those dinners when you attend, all of the religious who and who, who's who's were there. Everybody who was anybody had definitely better be at this Sabbath. While Jesus was in the home of the Pharisee's leader, he was given a test. A man was brought to him who was sick and in need of healing. The Pharisees and the other guests were inviting Jesus so they would test him. The Jewish law forbids healing or any other type of work on the Sabbath. And despite their test, Jesus cured the man. And he proved to everyone that was there that Jesus was a rabbi who didn't care too much about the rules and was more about the healing. After getting over this unspeakable act, they started to make their way to dinner. This is where Jesus noticed that all of the noble people were jockeying for positions at the head table. These places of honors at the table were quickly filling up, and for those who are not familiar with ancient Jewish dinner etiquette, the, I will fill you in. The places of greatest honor would be those closest to the host. So these men fight, bicker, and degrade their way to the seats of honor. So Jesus, being Jesus, decides to help set an opportunity to teach a lesson, as we hear in verses 7 through 11 in today's scripture. Luke is reminding us that since this is a parable, the nugget of wisdom that Jesus is trying to teach us is buried in there. And it's around verse 7 that he shows us and shows the people there that anyone who tries to put themselves in a position of honor will eventually find themselves humbled. But if we are willing to take the last, the least seed, we will be exalted. So no matter what decade you live in, this parable and root lesson is an old tale that we've all heard growing up. It's a clear idea that we've heard, though listening to the political scheme and the media, one can argue that things have been lost along the way. And as we grow older, materialism and other factors play. Let us now listen to the scripture and see how it speaks to us. The scripture today is from the book of Luke, chapter 14, verses 1 to 14. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. (laughs) 
For us, it's only human nature to want the best seat in the house. At sporting events, the prize seat is either the skybox seat, the 50-yard line, or maybe the one directly behind home plate. These are the places that have the best viewing area, and they carry the highest price. Don't forget they also come with sweet bragging rights. Because let's be honest, who doesn't love to go into work the next day after having the most amazing seats in the house and getting to tell anyone and everyone who will listen and put up with you about how awesome your seats were? Now, I know that some of you will say, I will never pay top dollar for any sporting event or music venue. That's just not me. Well, this idea comes through in different spots in our lives, and trust me, we all have a, the need for the spot. Have we ever watched people trying to find parking in a parking lot store, in a store lot? We have seen one person trying to find that perfect spot next to the entrance. And usually, it sometimes ends up pretty ugly. You might even see some people trying to swerve from hitting each other. But nobody wants that parking space out on the far end of the lot. And come 40 degrees weather and below, I'm going to be one of those people that is looking for those number one spots, especially around those cold holidays. But let's not forget, there is always one place where everyone and anyone can get the number one seat. For Emma and myself, that's the movies. When we go, however we feel and whenever we feel, we always get that number one spot. Though it does come with Emma looking at me, wondering, is this the middle? Did we get the best seat? And so I'll, she'll look at me with wonder, and I will try to try to figure out how I can determine this is the best. So two or three seats later, we do end up finding that perfect spot. And that one place is always makes everything okay in our world. But not everyone is pleased that easily. So looking further into this best seat concept, we need to examine where this idea from getting the best seat came from. And as we look at the scripture, it's not necessarily just an American-made concept or a 21st century concept. It goes all the way back to the Jewish times in the biblical in Bible. Even they had the concept of the best seat in the house, or rather, the synagogue. We know this because Jesus made mention of it. He told of the dinner party. He told of the dinner party of the Pharisees. Jesus also explains within Matthew of how much the Jewish culture of that time loved the best places at feasts, social events, and the other seats in the synagogue. This thirst for the best seat didn't stop with just the Jewish synagogues. We see it echo throughout history and through church. Synagogues typically had raised platforms in the front, just like we do here. And they would normally be reserved for places of worship leaders, visiting rabbis, or other religious dignitaries. We often ask to participate by reading scriptures or giving a lesson. So it was an honor to have the opportunity to sit in one of these seats up here. So try to hold back your jealousy as you see us sitting up here. I know we do look regal. But oh, I have to say things have changed from being up here to being as uh, a child in the church. For us, the prime spot was different. For us, it looked like the back row and the far, far back row of the church. And my friends and I would compete every single Sunday to try to get our family in the pew to fill up so that obviously they couldn't. And so we would fight back and forth trying to get our parents to get up, get going, and get in that seat. But my parents always loved to sleep in, so I was always a little bit just too late. But you know what? It was okay because there's always the holy munchkins at the end of the service to look forward to. But Jesus' disciples are human, and as you go forth, you know that they make the same type of struggles that we do as kids and as people. So disciples James and John are no different. They get into the best seat dispute in the book of Mark. Jesus, probably tired of putting out one of many fires that comes with traveling with 12 men 24-7, answers James and John, what do you want me to do for you? And they say to him, Grant that we may sit at your glory, one on your right and one on your left. In other words, we want the best seat in the kingdom, the places of honor, prestige, and power. I'm sure Jesus was slapping his head, hand to his head because these guys just don't get it. They don't see the bigger picture. Though 
I understand where they're coming from because it's a natural response, or at least to me, I can understand it is. We all want that best seat and the assurance and the justification, and having Jesus' blessing is just the cherry on top. So it's clear we need to take time to rethink what this best seat really is. Often, the first thing that comes to mind as I think about the least desired seat is how much I've earned it. After working so hard, missing vacation time, being good and doing what you have been told to do, which most of the time means missing out on other opportunities, family times, family dinners. So it's hard. But when you get the funds or something great gets offered to you like a place of privilege or honor, it's hard not to take that number one seat. But here, Jesus is telling us in verse 10, but when you are invited, go sit down at the lowest place a.k.a. the nosebleed seats on deck 500 with most likely obstructed views and a man who will eventually spill his drink on you. (laughs) So, okay, I guess we'll go with it. But Jesus has a lot of work to do if he's going to rewrite our psyche. But however you take this, there is something beautiful about this lesson. It's just buried in there, so trust me, hang on. Jesus has a lot of work to do here, as, oh, sorry, and this makes me think about the story of what my grandfather used to tell me when I would get a little bit too eager. During the American Revolution, there was a group of new recruits busy repairing a break in the barricade. The work was really too heavy for just the little small group of men that were working on it, and their commander was shouting instructions but was making no attempt to help them. An officer in civilian clothes rode past, and he asked, why the leader of the group wasn't helping the others. The leader replied with great dignity, Sir, I am a corporal. The stranger apologized, dismounted, and proceeded to help the exhausted soldiers. When the job was finished, he turned to the corporal and said, Mr. Corporal, next time you have a job that takes more people and is really hard, and you don't have enough men to do it, go to your commander-in-chief and I will come and help you. The officer in plain clothes was no other than George Washington. Embarrassed as I am to admit, I sometimes think like the corporal. I feel like I have those moments where I don't want to humble myself, and we don't want to get our hands dirty, which is just like the guests at the wedding feast that Jesus was describing. We would rather emphasize our rank over the others and be noticed for it, We want to push them ourselves to be as high as we can. And even if that means stepping on others to do it, it's the law of the jungle, we say to ourselves. It's the survival of the fittest. Eat or be eaten. But it's not what Jesus is teaching here. Biblically, we are reminded to never let anything be done with selfish spirit or pride. But in humbleness of mind, let us regard each other with love. So as we start finding humility and the superiority of our earthly context starts to melt away, and we're able to hear what this least desired seat is meaning as we open ourselves to this message. One thing that needs to be said, however, is that someone might be tempted to say or think, well, Jesus is saying that climbing the ladder of success is not what I'm supposed to do. Then I'll just sit back at the bottom and never aspire to be anything than more than I am. That kind of thought is not what Jesus is teaching here. He isn't condemning progress or moving up. Rather, he's teaching against our natural tendencies towards arrogance and making out that we are more than we really are. There's nothing wrong with working hard to move up. It's just that Jesus wants others to do the promoting. Don't do it ourselves. Let our work speak for us, not our mouth. This idea is that the host of the party sees the hard work and the humbleness of our hearts and comes to us and says, please, friend, move higher. You deserve this. Luke doesn't mention it here, but where do you suppose Jesus is sitting in all of this as he's telling the parable? I guarantee you he wasn't in the middle of those men pushing each other to get to the best seat. That wasn't Jesus' way. It will make a difference if we keep Jesus in mind while we are learning this concept. Years ago, there was this Scottish man, a successful businessman who had a son, an only son. He was very proud of his boy, 
Outwardly, the boy was well-mannered, well-educated, and well-respected. At least he was until he left home. Once away from the father's guidance, he turned his back on his upbringing. He indulged in every kind of access that he could, sowing his wild oats as crazy as he could. But until one day, as he was working at, at his office, he was arrested for embezzlement. At the trial, he was found guilty. Although the proceedings and everything came back through quite quickly, the jury foreman was reading the verdict, and the young man appeared essentially unaffected and unconcerned and arrogant. No one was going to humiliate this man. When the verdict was brought in, the judge told the young man to stand for the sentence. The arrogantly young man stood proud, still looking cocky. With a haughty glance, he looked around the courtroom, and that's when he saw his dad. He hadn't seen his dad for several years, and this elderly man had stood up and moved to the front. When the younger man looked at his dad, he saw a man who had once stood with head and shoulders erect with pride. Now those same shoulders were bowed low with sorrow and shame as he stood to receive, though it was his own sentence, his son's sentence from the judge. At the sight of his father's humiliation, because of his disgraceful conduct, the son finally began to weep bitterly. And from the first time in the whole trial, he repented of his crime. For Christians, that's what happens in our arrogance and our self-importance. We suddenly get a glimpse of Jesus, the Son of God who has taken the humiliation we should be feeling ourselves upon himself. That picture, more than any other, deflates any arrogance that we have. We take the humble seat as the best seat in the house because it's our Lord's seat. He showed up and he showed us the way by willingly heading to the bottom of society's ladder, to the place of a criminal, to death on a cross, falsely accused before all who watched, though he did nothing wrong, and he did it on our behalf because he humbled himself. So now, when we find ourselves on life's stub hub, let us remember as we search for the best seat in the house, there is more to our humanity. And in this theater of our everyday lives, let's take the time to stop and stay very humble and let God usher us to the best seat in God's house. Amen. <laughs>